wouldn't be able to get there. And I think it's, it's it, you know, you're, we're making lem, lemonade out of lemons or whatever it is. And good, good luck. And I, so I, I'll join in this afternoon, even though it wouldn't be a place I'd, I'd normally walk to. Well, we, we welcome you, Ken. And, and, you know, you make a great point. I, I will say that I, I um, having eight hours a day of Zoom meetings is can be fatiguing. <laughs> but, um, but I do agree with you. Like, you know, the wonder of technology, right, and the way that it can bring people together. We, we live stream our commencement ceremony um, over the last couple of years anyway. But, um, but you are bringing up, I think, uh, a great point this technology has been able to bring us together, you know, when we are apart and um, it could, it could still be poignant, even though it's not the same thing as being able to be close to somebody and to hug somebody. But, um, uh, you know, there, you can do the virtual hug and I, I think it will still be meaningful today. And I'm glad to hear the bar mitzvah was, was special as well. Thank you. Cut. I, I wanted to bring up a, a, a town business matter, sure. uh, which is, which is planning and, um, and zoning. I attended the planning board meeting on Wednesday night by Zoom in which they ex spend a lot of time talking about consultants' proposals for a, a new 40-R zoning that might come to Amherst. We've been very slow and deliberate to talk about this. The last public meeting was in December, and now, of course, it's hard to get public meetings in which people appear in place. But I think this is an extraordinary opportunity to have a very deliberate look at our zoning because for, for two reasons. One, the, the, the disastrous economic situation now may mean that a little bit of the pressure is off for developers to come in with their money to build new buildings. The other is that we really don't know what's going to be after this is over. Or, and, and so we don't know what the town is going to be like. I don't have to tell you the questions about what the university and the colleges are going to be like, how they're going to behave, who's going to be here, um, is, is, going to, is going to have real impact on this town. But so this is a time when I think rather than have the traditional meetings where the board that's concerned uh, runs up some proposals, invites the public to come and speak to them uh, at a public session, and then de deliberates among themselves, that, that won't serve us well now. What will, I think, are a series of conversations in which we specifically invite people who have no specific interest in, in an immediate project. So I'd like to hear from developers now who don't have any plans for what they want to do, but want to talk about what they think the town should be doing and what the town should be like. I'd like to hear from uh, not only the business people in town, but their landlords. I'd like to hear from citizens who are close to town like me, I walk to town, but from people who also drive to town and need to find places to park in order to do their business or decide they can't and go out to the highway. And I think if, 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 if we ask the planning board or whoever the right, uh, or, or the planner, the planning department to set these up, looking at the proposal that the, um, and it's a very beautiful and elaborate proposal that the consultants brought, we have the time over the next year to give some deep thought to this. So. I hope we will not, um, I hope we will think unconventionally about how we get input from the public for this. We, we, we have done this over, over years. Um, a long time ago in ancient history, there was something called the Select Committee on Goals for Amherst. And I'm the only, probably the only living person who can remember that. But um, it's, it's, this is now a time to bring the people who have, have interest in this. And, and that of course, Tony includes significant conversations with people from the university and the colleges. So that's one part of my interest. The other is a question, Paul. The Wall Street Journal today has an article about Airbnb, and it says in it that one third of the people who are Airbnb hosts have single units. Two thirds of the Airbnb people really are, in effect, commercial developers who have multiple units that they rent out. And I wonder, uh, I, I just don't recall how the town is managing the Airbnb process in the town. And I just wondered if you could tell me, and this is, this, I'm, I'm probably talking too long and you want to give the other people a chance. So maybe we can do this some other time. But I, again, it's an opportunity now to uh, look hard at Airbnb because it's Airbnb, I think is a stealth invader of residential 
neighborhoods. And uh, it, 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 if, if we're doing this right, that's great. But if we haven't thought enough about it, I think maybe now is the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate that, Ken. You know, always you bring up great points and I'm glad you'll be watching graduation uh, this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think, Brianna, I think it might be really good. I see Lynn Griesmer is on the call. If she wants to join the room, you could, you could, uh, Tech, you could raise your hand, Lynn, or something, because this, when the first thing that this, or second thing Ken talked about, which, which was zoning and the 40R district, that really is a town council thing. And um, it's, it's a, you know, and that's, it'll be a zoning issue that goes through the planning board and then the, the uh, town council. Um, but Lynn and I are on a call every week with the uh, business improvement district and the chamber talking about a bunch of, um, you know, what are their interests? Uh, this sort of resilient Amherst initiative to not just save our businesses, but to be able to be in a position to bring back the businesses that are going to survive and reposition the town uh, for whatever comes next. And you're right, nobody knows what the shape of our economy is gonna be in or the shape of our institutions. I mean, the, all the words, I mean, Hampshire's announced that they're gonna reopen, you know, Amherst College, they've self-identified as a residential college. And I, I, I know the university expects, and Tony can comment on this, they expect to be an on-campus educational institution. I don't think anybody's going to remote education at the college level um, anytime soon, but it is the right time to be talking about what the impact is. And, and Tony can weigh in on that. And then as far as the Airbnb, uh, there is a new tax. If you do run an Airbnb that you have to uh, file for that tax. Um, and we have, you know, we were looking at sort of doing an inventory. We are scanning <clears throat> previously until the, until now, you know, the Airbnb listing so we could make sure that we could capture all the um, people who are using, you know, offering Airbnb rentals to make sure that they were complying with the, the state law requiring them to pay a tax because a piece of that comes to local you know, cities and towns. Um, so in terms of, you know, I don't know what the impact will be economically. Um, I don't really, we haven't heard of um, a lot of the apartment buildings utilizing Airbnb as an income source, um, but it's been more, uh, at least the developers haven't indicated that and we haven't seen that really happening. It tends to be more, I've got a second unit in my house. I've got a second, you know, extra, a spare bedroom I can utilize. Uh, and that's where, where we have seen it. Um, I know in other places um, where, where we were, we were in, um, I was in Baltimore and there's like a whole apartment building that was just Airbnb. Basically people bought the units and they utilized them and they were managed for them as, as, as a way of building a building. I have not seen that here. And I don't think that's the model that most developers are looking at. I don't know if there's a, a big enough market in Amherst for that. But Tony, do you have thoughts on any of those issues? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, a couple. One, um, you know, Airbnb as the single unit in someone's house, uh, you know, as we've seen, I think uh, will be struggling probably going forward, you know, in the same way that a lot of other um, businesses within the share economy uh, may suffer through, you know, uh, in, in the aftermath of the pandemic, both because people will um, likely not be uh, traveling as much. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of um, worrying about transmission and also, you know, costs are, are things that I think uh, may hurt the industry. I think it'd be, you know, it, with regard to Airbnb, I think it'd be roughly akin to what's going on with the hotel industry. You know, I mean, we can all hope that it'll rebound, but I think it's going to take some time. Um, and there's a recent, there's an article, at least in today's Times, which I haven't read yet, that talked about, about this um, very issue. Um, I don't think that we've seen, um, uh, you know, in our conversations with landlords and other developers, um, because we do have a, a connection with them through the university. Um, we haven't seen, you know, Airbnb as, as you know, a method for them uh, to, uh, bring in folks, you know, for short-term or long-term rentals. I, I would expect that those folks that are doing Airbnb who didn't want the hassle of having a tenant, um, you know, and maybe a detached unit or an attached unit that, that, you know, had a discrete entrance or something like that, will likely have to go back to that, you know, renting out, you know, more long-term 
Um, and so um, in some ways that would be, you know, helpful to the town to at least understand what the um, Airbnb census is in the future. Um, so uh, from the Airbnb perspective, I think, um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. I can't remember the second part of that, Paul, yeah, sorry. About rezoning and downtown and stuff oh. like that, I think. You know, I, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I you know, I'm sure that, um, you know, there is a discussion from a standpoint um, in which the university would be an interested observer. I don't think that um, we have a direct um, relationship to the zoning in, in downtown. I, I, I would, would hes hesitate to say that we do, but, you know, we'd certainly love to talk about what the possibilities would be for, um, you know, given the um, kind of innovation and spinoff possibilities you know, is that, you know, does that have anything to do? Does that factor into um, any kind of rezoning or any thoughts for downtown? But, um, you know, I, I'm sure we'd be an interested observer and, and, you know, would certainly love to have conversations, but I can't say that we're directly connected to that. Oh, am I in the room? You are. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Lynn's Hi, Lynn. the president of our council, for those of you who don't know. Um, first of all, thanks for the comments. And, and uh, nice to hear your voice. Uh, the uh, just something quickly on the Airbnb. The Airbnbs that I'm aware of are people who actually uh, either leave their home for a weekend and and then rent it out. Like this weekend would have been a big weekend to do that. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the situation where somebody may occasionally use their home in Amherst, but then they actually do it do Airbnb. And occasionally that has led to some serious disruptions where parties go and then they travel to another place and all of this facilitated by Facebook. But um, the, the thing we're not seeing in Amherst is what some of the towns, for instance, are cities in Italy have seen where people literally have given up their, in, their urban apartment, moved out, and now they use their urban apartment as a Airbnb and it leaves the in inner core of the city very decimated in many ways, very, very transient. So um, that's your scourge issue. Uh, going back to this um, zoning, I really wanna say there's many efforts going on. One is uh, even before all of this, the council and the planning board had started and the staff had started into a very serious conversation about an opportunity to really relook at zoning. And uh, we're geared up for that. And there's been a couple different ways that it's been going about with uh, the consultant, for example, that you heard the other night, uh, and also the, the work of the town staff who have had I ideas for what we might look at um, at zoning for a, a long, long time. But then in addition, Paul mentioned the quick, the, not quick, but the ongoing meetings we have weekly now with the bid and chamber. And so the chamber and bid have presented once, uh, in general, just about the situation uh, going on with our businesses. They did that at our community resources committee, which turned out to be a committee of the whole for the council because 10 of us were there. And then they, we had them actually come to the council just this past week where they presented, I don't wanna say a wish list because it goes beyond wishing. It's, it's a, a list of what it is we could do as a town to help uh, reopen Amherst to be part of resilient Amherst. And we met just yesterday with that list and we started saying, well, this one goes to this group, this goes to this group, this would be done here and this would be done there. And well, and we were able to do one of these. Um, so it's a very serious effort. And I just want to compliment our, our bid and our chamber for their just outstanding work during this entire time, as well as the town staff. I mean, it's um, Amherst is actually making its way through this in a manner that is um, probably exemplary for most cities and towns. Uh, the other thing we're looking at very seriously and hope will happen before the end of the month or right after the end of the month, and that is the reopening of the Amherst Farmers Market. So that's a um, very, but, but we want to do it in a way that it, people are feel safe and it's healthy. So the plans for that are still unfolding. And finally, congratulations, Brianna. Thank you, Lynn. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and I piggyback off um, one thing that, that Lynn said just about the uh, bid and chambers efforts. And, and, you know, I think that this, 
Um, so I am on uh, full disclosure on the board of the bid, and I think most people know that I was um, worked for the chamber for many years, and so I have a close attachment to the business community. I'm also um, part of the new downtown Amherst Foundation board, and with it, there's the Re Relief and Resiliency Micro Grant Fund, um, and I, you know, that is one thing that the chamber and bid um, have bound together to. Um, to do to provide support to local businesses. And, and you know, I think the one, one thing I wanted to say about this, because I think it's really important, is that our local businesses really matter here to the quality of life of Amherst. Um, I won't say it's more important, but I think it's equally important as supporting them as it would be to a nonprofit that um, supports um, some of our neediest. Um, most like, most, you know, for real, because <laughs> Or, or to say this, it, it, you know, has everything to do with the businesses, these businesses and who they employ. Um, they're some of the same people that are using the services, for, you know, of our, you know, beloved social service agencies. Um, these businesses um, support them. They support our local um, economy, our local nonprofits. Um, they're the ones that are sponsoring everything from little league teams to, you know, family outreaches light up the night. And, and so, you know, our businesses matter. Um, and our downtown um, and you know our entire um, Amherst area business community um, has always um, been really, really important to to us. And so I, I just you know I want to put that out there. The micro grant uh, fund uh, you know has been very successful thus far, but there are still ways to give. And I just you know uh, perhaps I shouldn't have this impassioned plea right here, but um, you know just thinking about the um, the difficulties with local businesses and what it looks like going forward when we come out of this and we start to reopen, um, it's, it's devastating. You know, we'll, we'll likely see up to, um, or maybe I don't want to put a number, but a significant number of our local businesses will not be able to reopen. Um, it's really exciting to watch those that have been able to innovate and have been kind of successful through the pandemic thus far, but, um, you know, okay, what would what would you say to the people who are listening about who want to help? What, what's the best way people can help right now? I would, I would say go to the downtown Amherst Foundation site, um, and there you can make a gift. Um, you know, again, the fund has been successful thus far. It's raised about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. We're hoping to raise five hundred thousand dollars. We know that the money that will be distributed uh, from this fund will not be enough to. Um, you know, keep businesses afloat on its own. But, um, you know, it's hopefully a lifeline along with other federal programs and state programs um, that, um, and perhaps some relief, you know, in other quarters that will be able to, um, you know, push these businesses uh, to solvency once we reopen again. So, um, you know, I, I do ask people, you know, to keep that in mind. I do want to give Liz a chance who's still in the room. Liz, did you still want to um, ask a yes. question or make a comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, uh, Liz's name came up, but I'm Priscilla White, and I was putting my hand up, but we share the computer, so. Okay, well, welcome, uh, Priscilla. Yeah, so, um, hi, I just wanted to um, briefly say I'm also a UMass grad, as uh, from way back, as is my oldest grandson from a few years back. So um, lots of ties to the university. And I uh, hope to tune in today. Uh, there, there are, I live on um, Lincoln Ave, diagonally across from the Lincoln Apartments. And I talk to some of the students in the house nearby. And uh, so I, it's a hard time for graduating students. I have another grandson too who's graduating. Um, this year. So um, what I was ask, calling to uh, ask about today was the status of uh, contracting with a developer for um, both the Lincoln Ave and the Mass Ave uh, projects. And I um, was grateful to Dorothy Pam, who I think contacted you prior to COVID-19 about um, you both of you, um, about uh, just some of the logistics of the demolition and uh, construction. But um, so I was wondering today um, if a developer has been chosen and if so, 
Are there permitting applications going forward? What's the timeline for demolition and construction? Um, are there elevations that we could take a look at of the plans? Um, and if it's, if it's imminent, I'd like to have a chance to talk about um, one concern I had, again, way back when I thought it was gonna be um, May, that the, you know, or June, that the demolition would take place. It's just about, um, occasionally we have construction vehicles or trucks that queue on this block, and they just sort of sit there for, it's not a lot, but it's occasional. They sit there for half hour, 45 minutes with diesel, you know, noise and diesel. And um, so we have to go inside. Um, I'm gonna be 75 this fall. And so we're sheltering in place here. So this is our little sanctuary for, we don't know how long. So anyway, those were, th that's the line of questioning I have. Where does it stand now? and um, what, uh, what is available to share with the public in terms of uh, the plans. Um, so hi, Priscilla, how are you? Um, hi. We've been on many email, email trails together before, so, um, so it's good to hear your voice. Um, what I can tell you right now is that <clears throat> the university continues to move ahead with the process um, in selecting a developer. No developer has been selected as of yet. Um, so we anticipate that will happen soon. Um, I think at, at, at the point that it does, um, you know, more, I, I'd be able to reveal more information. But at this point, I think the only thing that we, um, you know, that I, that I can reveal is, you know, what we've uh, had, uh, what we sent out to our developers, which I think you can find um, through our news office and the news office press release. Um, I can send that to Paul. It could be, you know, I don't know how we can kind of distribute that, but, um, and that shows, you know, what we sent out to developers to solicit feedback uh, from them. So um, we are still moving ahead with the process, but there, <clears throat> at this point, there's no um, firm timeline for uh, demolition uh, and construction. The um, issue of the trucks, I remember that email very well, and, and I've talked to my colleagues uh, who oversee construction. I, there are reasonable accommodations that we can make, and particularly not having diesel um, vehicles idle in front of um, <clears throat> your, uh, you know, the Lincoln Avenue residents and coming up that way from, you know, from fearing um, up Lincoln. Uh, so, you know, there are things that we can do and ensure that, that you know, the trucks and the route that, that they have comes off uh, Mass Ave and then down towards the Lincoln apartments. There will still be some noise, as you might expect, that would be associated with construction. But we can do things that are, you know, um, you know lessen the impact as much as we possibly can. So, um, so I think what I would like to say is that, you know, we will from from our office because it's it's the role that we play with the community relations side of things um, continue to um, have discussions with uh, Paul and and his staff and of course with the with the neighbors around uh, our progress when we know more uh, and, and at this point you know we're still in that very long planning process and um, you know now the interviewing process with with uh, developers. So that's where we are, and I promise we'll continue to have that conversation. And I know that uh, Councillor Pam will make sure that we do. And I appreciate that, by the way, so. I appreciate all of that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that's, um, we have a little bit of time, breathing time. My family was all in construction, so I'm very aware of the importance of it and the right. associated distress to the in neighborhoods. So I'm not, you know, I know the construction is going to be what it'll be. So I just thought just to sort of mitigate some of the, uh, the trafficking would be great. So no, it sounds it, like you're thinking about that. Yeah. And it all makes sense. We want to be good neighbors and, and we realize that, you know, um, we don't live in a bubble. And so, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we'll do everything. And, and I think that this is part of the conversation though, too. You know, if, if there are moments where, uh, you know, you are impacted, we want to know. And, and so mm -hmm. you know, we'll do what we can to make sure that uh, we mitigate that impact or, or, you know, remove it completely. 
So, so right. Tony, since since there isn't there hasn't been a developer chosen, then it's at it's months, many months out before even anything would be considered moving forward. I'm guessing. I mean, there's once a developer is chosen, then things can start to happen. But until that happens, so are we? Are you thinking it's like three, six, nine, twelve months away? Um, I, I have to say, I really don't know. Um, okay. The and I, I say that with all honesty. Yeah. It, it, it you know these things are, are really long processes, but at the same time, I think that um, you know we're still proceeding on the, the you know at least uh, in our minds on the timeline that, that we've been talking about about the uh, what what is it twenty twenty two I think is what we we were talking about, and so um, that is still our hope. Uh, you know, construction timelines are always you know oh. kind of good. And um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I certainly, I think we'll all know a little bit more shortly. It, and the pandemic hasn't derailed the process that it, the need is the need in terms of what you've identified. Exactly. And, and you know, uh, unlike uh, Boston, which put a moratorium on construction, you know, as you know, all of our building projects have continued. So I, I think with that in mind, this process is, is continuing. Um, I wouldn't say full speed ahead. I, you know, the pandemic may have delayed things just because it's harder to meet or it's harder, you know, but, um, and I don't know that for sure. I mean, it, we, we could still be on just a, you know, our, our, the, the regular timeline that we were on, but, um, uh, but no, nothing, nothing will stop that. And, and we, we have identified those needs where we will be moving ahead. All right. Well, thank you. And just one last thing, if I, wanted to see what um, you put out for your request for information to the, did you say the new, how would I find that? Um, on the news office, you can look up, um, uh, I wouldn't know at the moment what the best keywords were, but uh, we did put out a release, I, I believe, uh, I want to say in the fall, probably October, September, October. So it has been yeah. a while. So I can, yeah. if, if you send that to me, Tony, I can share it out with the town council and they can share it out or we can, I can talk to Brianna about if there's an appropriate place to put it on our website. I'm not really sure about that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. All three of you. <laughs> and congratulations <laughs> to you, Brianna. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Priscilla. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. All right. So I do see another hand, but I want to remind attendees um, who might have just recently joined, joined us, you can use the Q&A feature if you have a quick question you want to pose, or if you'd like to join the room, please raise your hand via Zoom or press star nine from your phone. Um, I do see that Ken has another question, so I'm going to pull Ken in the room and ask that he unmute himself if he has another question. Thank you, Brianna. Okay. Ken Rosenthal in Sunset Avenue. Earlier, Tony, you said you didn't think there was much the university could say in a, in a discussion, uh, further discussion on zoning, but I'd like the university to think of itself as having a very important role in these kinds of decisions. You are, after all, the biggest landlord in the area, and more than that, your attraction of students who don't live on campus means that you're responsible for bringing people in who then our residents throughout town. So we no longer have the University Town of Amherst Collaborative. There's no place for a voice to, that I know of to, for the university to join with the general public in talking about this. So I'm just hoping that when the 40R planning uh, gets to become robust that you do, you do participate. And I'm, on a, oh, I'm sorry, and then I have one more thing to say about downtown. Okay, can, can I, if, if I can respond to that, Ken. I, I don't mean to say that we would, um, you know, uh, not be interested, you know, we're, we're very concerned about what's best for, for Amherst and what's best for downtown. I think that um, how we play in that though is, uh, you know, I think more as an observer and a supporter of, you know, a strong positive downtown. Um, and, and what that may look like. You know, I think that there are ways in which we can partner and Paul and I have talked about that a lot and Paul's had that conversation with our chancellor and, and you know, um, our university relations staff about, you know, ideas and thoughts. And, and we've talked about a lot of this with, with UTAC, but I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we do recognize, um, you know, some limitations there within the process. However, you know, if, if it's a matter of bringing in expertise or, or thoughts, you know, I mean, the university is represented, perhaps not officially, but we do have, you know, of course, many faculty and staff members and plenty of people of expertise as, in their roles as private citizens that, that, you know, certainly would weigh in with 
and, and have opinions on, on, you know, creating greater connections perhaps between um, the campus and community through through um, better zoning. So, uh, you know, I, I, I you know I want to make sure that I explain that well, and perhaps I, I don't, and you know, haven't. But um, I hope that that makes a little bit more sense. And then the other thing I want to say is about the about the UTAC thing. Um, no, we don't have UTAC, but we we still do have the Campus and Community Coalition, which was originally the Campus and Community Coalition to reduce high risk drinking and. We have um, in many you know, places, you know, in the absence of UTAC, um, uh, the CCC has you know, kind of grown beyond its uh, original um, you know, uh, mandate to reduce high risk drinking. That's still a big part of what we do, but we've looked at things uh, like uh, quality of life issues and environmental interventions. Um, the business community is a big part of the CCC, we have uh, town council members that attend, and it has been a forum for ideas that may not be contained within the CCC meeting structure, but have uh, you know um, created organic um, opportunities for uh, different people from from uh, the campus and, and the community to come together and come up with great brainstorming ideas for for solutions. And I, I'll point out one thing that even parallel to UTAC is. Several years ago, we had a grant from the CCC to um, kind of envision what a, a downtown, uh, a, a late night downtown might look like with activities that, that weren't related to, to alcohol, you know, and um, the, the forum brought together about 40 people. It was before Amherst Works was completed. We were in the, the roughed out space there and, you know, it was a good conversation. We had a lot of um, input, you know, and, and a lot of student input and uh, during that meeting was it was really quite good, and I think the CCC might be able to play more of that role, um, you know, in, in the future. It's just a convener, if nothing else, uh, for ideas. So, um, so fear not. Without you know, in the absence of UTAC, um, you know, there were pluses and minuses with our our committee structure more than anything else. I mean, I did enjoy the the um, coming together with that with that group, though. Thanks, Tony. I just wanted to add one more thing, and it's about the downtown conversations. I think it's great that the bid and the chamber are talking with the town council regularly with the town administrators. There needs to be a, a place for the voice of the citizens of town, the people who you want to come into town to support downtown. And again, this pandemic is giving us a, an interesting opportunity. Uh, not only is the town of Amherst uh, economy in, in a mess there, but so are the malls on the highway. And we're all behaving differently. We're staying home, we're ordering and having delivered things delivered to our houses. When this, when this uh, opens up again, there may be more interest in coming down to town to a, a small community where there are fewer people going into smaller stores rather than large numbers of people going into big stores. Um, we may be just be behaving differently. And this may be a great opportunity to think about the revival of downtown. I'm for one, and very much supportive of that. And I hope you'll, there'll be an opportunity for the voice of the people who are, are the shoppers, the ones who are spending the money to, to, to get their interest, to get their ideas about how they could look more to the town than to the highway for shopping or, or, or to the mail for shopping. So I hope we'll just do that. And I'll, now I'll, I'll yield the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So we did have a question come in through our Q&A. So I'm gonna read that now. Um, this question came from Council, uh, Councillor Dorothy Pam, who's on the call with us. If UMass is remote instruction this fall, what kind of oversight will the university have over students who choose to remain living in the town of Amherst? Um, the, it would roughly be the same oversight that we have now. And, and Dorothy, thank you for the question. Um, you know the code of this student code of conduct conduct excuse me still um you know is in effect off campus however you know it is um you know it's only utilized when you know work with working through the police if there is a police complaint and then there is a police action that is taken then that is brought to the dean of students office and then um you know actions are taken we have um, over the last several years worked closely with APD with our Dean of Students Office to, you know, take an education as first approach. And I think when those students come back, 
Um, if we do have a sizable number or even a small number of students that are living off campus, we'll be doing the same manner of education that we normally do, um, except perhaps um, maybe we will be doing the door knocks, but it will be done, you know, in a way that is, um, you know, uh, safe and, you know, maintains respectful social distancing. But we've come up with some great team efforts. Um, Dorothy, I know you've been on a number of emails with um, your constituents and um, uh, Officer Laramie, uh, Captain Ting, me, Sally Lenowski over the last, um, you know, couple of days. And, um, you know, we will continue to uh, maintain the same level of support and commitment to, uh, you know, our off-campus community as we have, uh, you know, under normal times. Great. Great, thank you for the question, Councillor Pam. Tony, I wondered if you could give us some examples of past successful town gown initiatives and maybe some ways in which you envision the town and the university working together in the future. Sure, I, I think that there's a, a ton of things that we do together and, um, you know, and, and a ton of great ways in which we work together from, you know, regular meetings that, that Paul and I have with, um, you know, my, uh, my boss, Nancy Buffon, and, and Dave Zomex also involved with that. And those meetings are, happen on a regular basis. Um, Jeff Kravitz was a part of that as well, you know, before he left and went to Sunderland. Um, so, um, but, uh, uh, you know, we also have quarterly meetings with uh, Guilford Mooring staff. Um, and then, you know, what comes of those meetings are often more meetings. But, you know, there's a lot of things that happen there. I think what we're most proud of is the work that we've done with public safety, um, both uh, the fire department and with uh, the police department. It's a great partnership. And it has uh, come up with a number of terrific solutions. We, you know, through the CCC model, which is a collaborative model in which the community and um, the town and the university all take responsibility for, you know, um, for the response. We, you know, pick each other up where we need it. So like, I, I just thinking about, you know, SEPTED, which uh, w was such a successful, um, Nobody knows what SEPTED is. Tom. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a concept called crime prevention through environmental design. Um, and Ian Sear, um, who's deputy chief at, at UMPD, was recently certified in SEPTED and was, was teaching a, uh, you know, a little 101 class to, um, uh, to UMPD and invited uh, my office to be a part of it, invited some members of APD to be a part of it as well. And, as part of this little thing, there were some projects that they did. And, you know, a group of us um, took a look at uh, what was going on in North Amherst. And at the time, there were a number of, um, you know, number of gatherings there with, you know, lots of students in open courtyards up at the townhouse apartments, particularly. We also looked um, at Hobart Lane. Um, and what we did through that, that partnership is, um, you know, a, a group took a look after adopting SEPTED principles, which often, you know, it, it's, it's about more light, for example, or, you know, changing the flora and fauna of a, of a certain place to make it inhospitable for people to um, either walk through, or in some cases in a dark area, it would be to be cutting some brush back so that people could see and feel safer. Um, in the case of townhouse um, and, and, you know, the Hobart area, um, over in Hobart, you know, in, in a place where there was a lot of darkness, it would be a place for, you know, easy congregation by, by large numbers. Um, you know, light is a great fumigator. And so, um, you know, it was suggested you put a light in a place where it couldn't be knocked down. Um, and, you know, you kind of flood that area, um, you know, in, a, in an area where there was an open, um, open space for people to get together, you know, some, again, inhospitable plantings were, in, were put into place. Um, over at the townhouse area where, where courtyards were open, um, you know, by working with the landlords who were also a partner in this, uh, Pat Caymans was able to uh, construct a fence that was, that was really high and, and so kind of hard to get over. Um, the only way that you were able to get into the courtyard was to go through an apartment. So we would have a sense of who, uh, you know, who was, 
you know, bringing people together and, and creating large gatherings. So it really cut down on, you know, what we saw that phenomenon of, of the day drink um, at a, on a regular basis up in North Amherst. And, and we were really proud of that. Um, you know, that, that was one great successful um, initiative. It, it's been studied uh, through uh, presentations and, and conferences with the International Town Gown Association. So, so we talk about what we do. Um, and that's one example. That's one big example. There, there's so I, many others. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's also a weekly call every, mo every Monday, the police and fire and um, from both, you know, the, the both police departments and the fire departments and others get together and they just go through what's happened over the, over the weekend and get into really the nitty gritty detail about where have all the calls come in for noise disturbances, nuisance calls, and uh, start to monitor that and strategize how to address it whether at the university level or the town level or both. We have built in that meeting so much trust over time, you know, that um, we, we really have each other's backs and, and that's the great thing about that meeting. You know, we see each other weekly um, and, you know, again, it's an outgrowth of, of what happened uh, originally with the Campus and Community Coalition. This smaller um, regular meeting happens um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, again, a big, big success of, uh, you know, town gown success. I've got a couple hands in the room. So if you don't mind, I'm going to um, call on Joy. And Joy, you're in the room if you want to unmute yourself and um, introduce yourself and ask your question. You're, you're in. I'll give Joy a second to I like unmute. Joy's, I like Joy's picture. Yeah, Joyce had a nice picture. <laughs> okay, so I am going to pop you back out and just raise your hand again when you're when you're ready, and we'll pull you back in. Um, I do see Councillor Pam has her hand raised, so I'm going to pull her into the room. And Councillor, you have to unmute your mic, and you'll be in with us. Welcome. Okay. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Good morning, Dorothy. Good morning. Yes, this is um, this is early for me, I gotta say. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's no camera on me, I'm assuming, right? No, no. It's your picture. we see your profile picture, which is lovely. It's okay. on Bob. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Oh, I had such trouble. I, I understand how, how I did it. I, I was in the meeting, got bounced out and went back in. So I was in two meetings. So I was having this crazy echo. <laughs> um, so thinking about the future, okay, say at HCC, they made the decision uh, just about this past week, that we're going to be totally remote in the fall semester. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of holding off the registration a little bit until they see who's going to be uh, still in there. Um, let's say that we still have these students living in town and UMass is remote. Um, you know, I've had to be really involved with my students at HCC. Uh, and I do see, I do see, except for the young people who are working so hard in nursing homes, um, I see a lot of them just totally adrift. And they're, um, they're very worried and they're very lonely, a lot of them, unless they happen to be living at home and able to be helping their family. And sometimes that's positive and sometimes that's negative. So what kind of fun, what kind of activities will these um, UMass students living in the houses in our community do? And is there any possibility of some kind of new kind of social activity which combines them more with uh, us residents assuming that we ever can leave our houses um kind of in um you know a new kind of being because many of them are, are, are actually mature and behave very nicely but they don't have all the fun going on at the campus i mean it's it's the whole center is of, of activity is going to be gone so i'm kind of um i'm not just worried about parties and noise i'm also worried about um um their social and psychological happiness and well-being. And, and thank you for that, Dorothy, because I think that that's really um, important. This has been, uh, I think, uh, traumatic for, for students uh, all through, you know, I have a high schooler that's home and, and, and you know, it's been tough on him and, and a college student that, that has uh, had to leave uh, her first year experience um, in March as well. Um, and it's been tough on her, you know, I mean, they, they've, they've been okay, but uh, I can only imagine what it would be like uh, living far from home and uh, trying to figure out what to do. So, you know, this is all new this semester, of course, um, and there have been a lot of resources that the university has, has um, 
come up with through our well-being access and, and uh, prevention programs. Uh, Betsy Krakow is in, in, in a relatively new position at the university, but um, has really figured, trying, is doing what she can to figure out ways and use best practices to connect with um, our student body from afar. Um, so it, you know, the, um, you know, again, continuing with um, psychological services for those students that, that uh, you know, already had a need and uh, it is something that the university continues to do as well through, um, uh, through that area. So, you know, student affairs is, um, you know, uniquely aware of uh, the challenges of, uh, you know, our, our student needs. It, it's very difficult to administer to them, though, from a distance. Um, we didn't even really talk about what the fall was going to look like. You know, we kind of alluded to it. And, um, you know, it, it, it has been um, announced by the chancellor that we'll, we will be open, but we don't know what that looks like. And so it's, um, and, and, you know, so we will have um, instruction, whether it be fully remote or a blend, or we have all of our students back is something that we're still trying to figure out. And we have a number of different task forces looking at um, all different aspects from a full 360 degree view of um, what it would look like in any one of those scenarios and what we would need um, in every one of those scenarios. And, and, and the idea of student well being is a big part of all of these discussions. So I don't have any answers for you right now, um, at the, but, um, but we hope to soon. And, and, and certainly we will make that really clear through. Um, you know, through the materials and the information that we put out. Thank you. Any other comments, Councillor Pam? No, just no. that um, I, I would like us to be kept um, informed of what's going on. And um, I do think the university is going to be doing new things. And I think it's also, um, this is, uh, you know, for Paul to be thinking about a time for uh, us, the town, to think about how we can help, how we can interact. Great idea. Great. Thank you for your questions and your comments. Uh, we do have another question that came in from our Q&A here. Um, they are asking, how are you helping residents of North Village find alternative housing? Um, and just expressing some concern uh, about uh, those students during this pandemic. Um, we have been working with the students in North Village from the beginning when the announcement um, that, that there would be, uh, you know, eventually a new North Village uh, was made. Uh, we are, so we, we have staff, uh, a staff member particularly uh, that is working directly with all of those students. We are assuring them housing during the course of uh, the construction and, you know, as long as they are with us with the university, those that will be studying over the course of the two year construction period will um, be brought back to North Village if they choose, uh, choose to be. Um, the, uh, the rent will remain the same for those North Village students. We are, um, you know, working with the landlords to uh, make up the difference. And so this has been an ongoing discussion. It's been fruitful. And, um, you know, with regard to moving times and things like that, 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 that has, you know, been kind of more put on hold, but we uh, have, uh, you know, worked very closely with our North Amherst landlords <coughs> in most cases, um, because we wanted to make sure that uh, we can keep that community most as, you know, much intact as possible and uh, remaining in the school district that they call home. So, um, so we've done a lot of work with them. Great, thank you. So we are coming close to our 9 a.m. wrap time. I'm gonna give the room another chance to um, raise their hands or put out a question. Um, but other than that, are there any kind of parting words from either Paul or Tony? Yeah, I was morning? disappointed that Tony didn't get that you know, Friday tie day. It's not, this is <laughs> happening when you work from home, it's Friday's tie day. Um, I've lived with my beatnik look throughout the entire thing. I don't think that I've, I've not worn black, uh, you know, more than maybe twice. You know, it's slimming, you know, you want to make sure that the 10 pounds that the camera adds. I can't add any more weight on this thing. You're, you're not, you're, we're all getting the COVID-19, I think. You can get one of those tuxedo t-shirts for, for tie day. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> I was about to wear my hockey jersey because I was looking around for, you know, some UMass gear, which has had to go to my son because it doesn't fit me anymore. You know, I've, I've grown out of it just in the wrong way. <laughs> I hear there's a pretty good store on campus, though. You could probably. <laughs> I, 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 yes, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, so I don't what, are doing, what are you doing to celebrate today, graduate? Yes. Go. Well, I, obviously at 430, I have a, um, something to watch. Yeah. I'll be watching a, the commencement video. Or, or what are we officially calling it? It is the commencement celebration video. And it's not commencement, but we are celebrating our graduates. We will bring those students back at some time when it is but we can, you know, be safe and um, bring everyone together. So I'll, I'll be celebrating by par, um, kind of doing my bit with the local economy and patronizing. I think Mission Cantina is going to be the, the choice um, tonight. So we'll, we'll be we'll be doing a little bit of that. Yeah, you know, I, I'll give you a tip when we get off here. Maybe maybe you've already <laughs> learned this. Tip. It, it's really hard to get through on that phone line. I'm actually have it dialing right now. <laughs> That's so. a good idea. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, they're, they're so wonderfully busy. It's great to see. It's all that Paul's on. <laughs> I'll take the taco <laughs> combo. All right. That's the graduate. Good. Good. That's for you, Brianna. Nice. <laughs> I love that. MIDI file. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So basically, basically just that, you know, be with the family and probably wave to some friends as they drive by and honk. Uh, past my house so luckily I live in a community where there's a lot of friends in walking distance so I can watch them as they uh, from my office window here as they walk by nice yeah nice congratulations thank, thank you. you yeah it was a big accomplishment she did it while raising a raising a kid working full-time and then being the star of her class so yeah. you know pretty impressive accomplishment Brianna Thank you. And thank you for that month off that you promised. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's happening now oh. <laughs> as you homeschool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, thank you both for that. And I, I do want to thank everybody who joined us here today and your questions. Um, a couple quick minutes before we wrap, if there's anything we didn't get to ask you, Tony, that you feel is important for us to know about Amherst, your work at Amherst or at the university. No, I, I just, you know, I think um, for those out there, you know, this is such a wonderful place to live and to work. Um, you know, we are so blessed that, and I really mean that, to have the university and the two colleges here and everything that they bring. Um, and, you know, there's a, a whole lot more pluses than there are minuses. I, I so am looking forward to the day when we can come back and when we can all be in the middle of the street at the block party or something and start to hug each other again, because um, that's the one thing I miss. I mean, I, I was, um, you know, I just think back to the last, you know, kind of um, event, big event that we had, which was, you know, that I, that I was in back in February at the Eric Carl Museum. And, um, you know, it's, one thing I was able to say then was, was just how much this community matters and, and Amherst is about its people. And, um, you know, I, I feel privileged to be here. So, and thanks for today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us so early on what yeah. is your birthday and usually your biggest day of the year uh, yeah. with commencement. Yeah. I am really disappointed that, you know, 25,000 people aren't here to celebrate me today at McGurk, but, uh, We'll get them next year. And what are you doing, Tony, for your birthday? Actually, I don't even know. I'm probably oh. sleeping after after five o'clock, you know, so <laughs> be happy. Good. All, all right. right. Thanks for doing this, Brianna. Yes, Thanks thank you everybody. all. Thanks Have for everybody who tuned day. in. Have a great day. See you.